Hello again. It's great to have such a wonderful crowd with us today. So thankful you're here. Again, for our guests, um, welcome. We're going to focus on the Word of God at this time and what Jesus says is the most important thing in your life. Like, what's the most important thing? Where does your mind go? Well, I mean, my mind kind of goes to the immediate sometimes. I don't know, I need to do this. This is how I live. This is how I live. Right? I need to, maybe you need a new job. Maybe you need, like, a new girlfriend. I don't know. But, you know, what? that's not the most important thing. Now, that may be important to you. I know some of our teenagers, that's important, right? But what's the most important thing? See, I love narrowing the focus. And this passage of Scripture is extremely important because Jesus says it's important, but it's important to our church because this is what our mission, what we do as a church, is based on. And this gives you a lens. I love Kenneth, just great job. What's the lens that we can look through as we really look at our entire lives? What's the lens that we can look through? So open your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Mark. This should be familiar because the last three years this has been very important to us. Mark chapter 12, and I will have it on the screen if you don't have your Bible in front of you. Hear the word of God this morning. Verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, what's the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor yourself is the most important than all burnt rock offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that He had answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. From then on, no one dared to ask Him any more questions. I love this text. I just, it's kind of humorous to me at points. You know, they're trying to trap Jesus. And if you look at the previous passages in Mark, uh, even 11 and 12, you know, they're just coming to Jesus with all these questions because they want to trap Jesus because they're jealous of Jesus because of all the people who are coming to Jesus and following Jesus. And he's not doing Things the right way, according to the church leaders of the time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. And this man is a scribe, which means he knew the law inside and out. He knew the Bible inside and out. So he actually knew what he was asking Jesus, I believe. But they're just testing Jesus. Testing, testing, testing. And so he says, what is the most important thing? And I kind of like that. Because, you know, the Bible... This, this Bible has tiny words. They get smaller every year. And, you know, look at all. This is called a thin line Bible. So small words on thin pages. And there is so much in I want the bottom line. I'm a kind of a bottom line guy. I don't read instructions. When I get something, I just try to figure it out and put it together. I just, I just want it put together, right? I, I got something from iCloud. It just keeps popping up on my computer. You have to agree to this. And you look, and there's like 30 pages. And I'm like, okay, just agree. I don't read that. Like, if, have you ever, like, bought something and, and just had, doc, like, maybe a car, right? Document after document. Do you, does anyone here actually read those things before you sign them? Don't, don't be afraid, Richard. Wendy reads them. 
<laughs> you read the, uh, Jason, you're an accountant. That's good that you would read those things. Right? I don't read those things. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You, you know, are they going to take my house? Are they going to take my car? No, okay. Just sign it, right? Like, just, just tell me the bottom line. Even some of my study habits in school were, I don't know, they still have a thing called cliff notes, and I probably shouldn't even say about cliff notes, right? Yeah. But I don't read, what is it now? Okay, yeah, so I don't read the whole book, I just go to those things, right? You know, or read the end of the chapter. Does anybody else here honestly just read the end of the book before you read the whole book? Anybody? <laughs> Yay, I'm not the only one. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Yes, so you get what I'm saying, and so it's like of all the commandments, what just Jesus, what's the most important thing to tell? And Jesus answered. He doesn't say it's all God's word. It is all God's word. It's the word of God. It's all God. It's all good. Know it all. Well, I think that would be good. Jesus says, "Oh yeah, if you get anything, there's something more important for your life that you need to understand this morning. Of all the things that are important in your life." Jesus says, I hope you prioritize. Isn't that what we're doing this year? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things that you desire are going to be given to you. God will take care of it. Put him first. And so Jesus is saying, it's called, I think it's called the Shema. And if you go back to the Old Testament, like Leviticus, when the commandments are giving, this was so dear to the Hebrew nation. These words to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength the most important thing, Jesus said. It was so important to them that they would wear it around their neck. They would carry it in a little box in tiny, tiny, tiny writing. Love the Lord your God. And they'd wear it right where their heart is. And it would hang. And, or they would tie that verse to the, if you've seen some of the, the, the Jewish people with the long hair coming down, and they would tie it to the, to the braids in their hair because Every morning, every night, before they, they wake up, this is what they would say. Hear what's from hell. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. That's what they would say. Jesus added, love your neighbors yourself. But if you look in Leviticus, neighbor is everywhere. That's how important. They start their day, they end their day by saying this. Now, some of you remember an author by the name of Josh McDowell. He wrote a book called Evidence Demands a Verdict, and it's proofs of the Christian faith. But I, re I never forget the way he started out his book. He said, this Bible here is written by over 40 different authors, over seven continents, Uh, 600, over 600 commands. I think, let's see, there's 613 commands in the Old Testament. It was written over thousands of years. Uh, I just Googled this because you can do this now. There are 783,137 words in the Bible. 800,000 words. And Jesus says four are the most important. Four words. And if you get those four words, it proves you get everything else. Love God. Love your neighbors. Most important thing. I love Hilltop because we're a church that is being intentional about saying, you know what, we can focus on a lot of things, but we're going to focus on the most important thing, which is love. People come into this church, they should just see we love God and we love each other and we love our neighbors. There's nothing more important. And so that's what it says. Now, look, look back at this verse 20, 29. Jesus says, the most important one, answer Jesus, is this. And you can read this with me or if you've memorized it like we try to do as a church, you can say it by memory. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second answer, Jesus, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's nothing more important. And then I get a kick out of this because this scribe who asked Jesus this question, 
He's, Jesus just lays it out, and, and they're kind of funny. He's like, good, good job, Jesus. He obviously has no idea who Jesus is. I mean, would you say to go on, you got it right. <laughs> of course. This is God in the flesh. This is Jesus. So, and, and Jesus is very patient with him because after he kind of quotes it back, Jesus says, good job, you got it right, too. If you do that, you're in the kingdom of heaven, right? You're not far from the kingdom of heaven. And you are so close. Four words, love God, love your neighbors. And what if you could just live out those four words? How would that impact your life? How would that impact the people around you when we are in such a divided, hostile, negative, critical culture today? You think about Hollywood and the backbiting that's going on. You think about politics and it is just sickening. What if we as a church actually decided to live this out? How would that change us if we really loved God and were so full of God's love that it just spilled out like a, like a river? It just God's love just flows through the church like a river, right? And, and I'm sure some of you have heard this before. God's love was never meant to be a reservoir. You know, yesterday I drove by the reservoir off the 5 freeway. And what do reservoirs do? Reservoirs are these big um, areas that hold water. But, but that's not God's love. God's love is never meant to be a reservoir. We come to the church and we love each other. And is the church, the family of God, just for us? And, oh, we just love each other. But that's no one in, no one out. Nothing in, nothing out. We just, we love each other. That's not God's love. God's love is says, look, you church are to be a conduit. God's love. You are to be a, a river that, that the love of God just flows in and flows out. Will you let the love of God fill you up this morning? Will you just, just let the Holy Spirit just come in and remind you of how God sees you? Sometimes we're our worst enemy, aren't we? You know, we, we know ourselves too well. But you don't know yourself better than God knows you, and yet He still adores you. He loves you and he sees you through the lens of Jesus Christ. And his mercies are new every morning. It's interesting that he asks for the most important thing and Jesus gives two answers, right? Why does Jesus give two? What's the most important commandment? Love God. But then Jesus says the second is this. Is this just like he's giving a running commentary or, or is this important to us? Why does he say the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself? If you really love God, you will love your neighbor. In fact, the proof of whether you love God or not is if you love and how you love your neighbor. And if you don't love your neighbor, guess what? You don't love God. They go together. They are hand in glove. If you truly love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will love your neighbor. It's just a byproduct of the love of God. The love of God, Peter says, compels us. The love of God motivates us. The love of God drives us to love other people, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what do you think when you hear heart, soul, mind, and strength, what comes to mind? Well, your heart, you know what your heart is, right? You know, that's your feelings. You know, I love God with, with my heart, my heart. My heart, does your heart ache for the broken people that are around us and the broken neighborhoods and the, at school? Does your heart break at school for the people who are just hurting and broken and lonely and discouraged? And they're all around us. See, love God with your heart. You're going to love your neighbor with your heart. That's how we feel. Love God with your soul. What's your soul, by the way? I, I hear people say, he's my soulmate. I found my soulmate. I'm not knocking that. That's great. But what do you mean by that? It's my soulmate. The soul is that deepest internal part of you. It, it, the soul is the core of your very being. So you don't only love God with your feelings. You love God with the core 
of who you are. That's what Jesus is really driving at. This is just, this is a complete love. It, it, it encompasses your heart. It encompasses your core. And it encompasses your mind. Where, where you, you, you think about the love of God. You think about how God, and you think about how's it translating to loving other people. It's, it's your mind. It's your thoughts. If you love something, think about what you just, you love that you have. Maybe it's something that you own, or maybe it's a, a friend. And, and if you really love them, are you thinking about them? I'm thinking about my kids all the time. Every day, there's not a minute that goes by, I don't think about my children, and now my precious little granddaughter. Think about her all the time. <laughs> Martha got, got on me the other day, because Martha Hudson, she said, John, you got up to preach, and you didn't mention your granddaughter. <laughs> I guess you're just used to it. Every Sunday, I'm going to say something about my, but it's true, right? So if you're going to love God with your mind, what are you thinking about? Thinking about God, and then if you're going to love God with your strength, what is that? That is your heart, mind, and core put into action. But you say, well, well, like Becky, thanks for letting me use you. Um, if I said, you know, you, well, it's like you tell me you love me, why don't you do something about it, right? If I just not die for you, right? I heard somebody say that the other day. I love you so much, I'd die for you. Why don't you do something about it? Um, <laughs> you wouldn't say that. Okay. Uh, I, I love you with my head, but my heart's just not into it. But, but I love you. I think I do. I think about you. You know, I, I love you with my heart. But I'm just going to sit around and be lazy and not do anything to show you that I love you. That would make no sense at all, right? You don't really love. That's why you've got to have heart, soul, mind, and action. Straight, heart, soul, mind, and strength. So Jesus call, calls us to love God. That love God moves us out to love other people, heart, soul, and mind, and strength. If you love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're going to love your neighbor with your heart. You're going to feel and care for your neighbor. With your mind, you're going to think about your neighbor. And I'm not talking neighbor like your next door neighbor, although that is your neighbor. Your neighbor is like what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Do good for all people. All the people. Who, in other words, your circle. You, you can't do good for all the world, but you can do good for your circle of people that God puts you around. So you're going to love that, that neighbor in the workplace, that neighbor in the grocery store. You're going to love your family. They're, they're the first neighbors that God has given you, and they're living with you. For that time, you're going to love your family that's hard to love. Why? Because you're so full of the love of God. It's not because they're wonderful people and they think you're amazing and do all these things for you. That's a worldly love. Your motivation is the love of God. So you're going to love your enemy. You're going to pray for those who persecute you. That's a high calling, church. But that type of love will change the world. That type of love will change this church. Oh, I love you in church if you agree with me. I love you in church if you're always nice to me. I love you in church, but then as soon as you do something that to me is not loving, well, I don't love you anymore. That's the way the world loves, not God's church. Love. And, and we see, even in, in these passages we've looked at, that the priority is the family of God. Do good to all people, especially who? Those to the household of faith. We have to love each other because Jesus said they will know you're Christians by what? Your love for one another. That's what, that's what he's driving at. Now, two other passages. Take a look at James 2. Let's get that on the screen if we can. Uh, James 2.8 says this. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Whoa, now hold on a second. Love God, love your neighbor. James, he's breaking it down even more. You want to fulfill the love of God? You love your neighbor as yourself. And then Galatians says this. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, when I think about James chapter 2, what do you remember about James? He's saying that if you say that you love someone in word, you will love them in deed. 
So if you in an inaction. So if, you, if you're going to say you love your neighbor, what, what, what will you do for your neighbor? And as a church, if we say we're going to love God and we're going to love our neighbors, what will that drive us to do? How will that change us if we just simplify our lives and our actions through this lens? And how important are these passages? Jesus says the most important thing. And you know what James and Galatians say? That eternity hangs in the balance of these passages. Love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, did you, I hope you noticed that you are to love yourself. That's really important. Do you love yourself? And how do you love yourself? Not in a selfish way, but is it okay to love yourself and to set boundaries with people and to rely on God rather than you trying to fix it? Yes, absolutely. So you have to, in a sense, have very healthy boundaries. Did Jesus have boundaries? Did Jesus love himself? Yes, he loved God, of course. But remember when Jesus went up to the mountain to pray? And he's up there praying. And Peter comes up and he's like, what are you doing praying? All these people need you. And did they need Jesus? Absolutely. But he's like, that's not why I came. I didn't come to meet everybody's needs. I came to seek and save the lost. And I've got to go on to other towns. So Jesus, yes, he had boundaries. But Jesus was a master servant. Jesus was a servant of all. And so, yes, if you love, you will serve, but it's not a selfish love. So let me just give you a lens to see yourself this morning that is really important. You need to learn as a child of God to see yourself through the eyes of God and Jesus Christ. You've got to see yourself through the eyes of Jesus and stop seeing yourself through your own eyes or through other people's eyes because they do not define you. You're a child of God. He defines you. And so we must learn to see ourselves through God's eyes. In a passage, just listen to this. This is what Peter says about you this morning. I want you, please, you absorb this in. You are a chosen race. God chose you. You are a royal priesthood. What? You're not just a part of the priesthood of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A holy people. God's special possession. Man, that, that just warms my heart. You're God's special possession. That's the way he sees you. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Who are we? We are the people of God. Say that with me. We are the people of God. Wow. Once you had not received mercy. Once you... In your lifetime, you have not received mercy. But now, you have received the mercy of God. Because He absolutely adores you. That's how we have to learn to love ourselves. Because if we don't love ourselves, we cannot love our neighbor. Because God says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So now... I want to just help cast a vision for what this can look like. We love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let me put a few of our goals up for this year that we have. And I'm just going to briefly discuss them. But we'll be sharing these and talking more about these. First of all, to love God, starting next week, we're going to do a deep dive into the Gospel of John. It is a powerful gospel. We're going to spend three months in the Gospel of John, and the theme is sent. And Kenneth, you just did a beautiful job of introducing the Gospel of John and what God sent. Thank you for quoting John, by the way. What does it mean that God loved you enough that he sent his one and only son? To die on a cross for your sins. What does it mean that God loved you so much as what Kenneth read that he sent the Holy Spirit to be the power source and guiding light of your life? Love sins. 
And that's going to deeply impact you as, you as you go through John. That's just going to really impact how you see how much God loves you and what God has done that he sent. And then Jesus says in John 21, as the Father sent me into the world, I am sending you into the world. Why? Because love sends. Love sends. We're going to spend three months diving into that. And I believe it's really going to bless your life and draw you closer to the God that loves you and adores you so much. I believe it's going to really fill your heart like never before with the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then that's going to guide and direct your life. And then also, it's going to move us to our neighbors. And some of these things that we'll look at here, let's look at the next slide. So we're going to, our one goal is just we're going to do a deep dive in the Gospel of John. Another goal is we're going to continue to love our neighbors locally. How do we love our neighbors? That's what we're talking about. It's the most important thing, Jesus said. So what are we going to do? Celebrate recovery. God's moving powerfully through Celebrate Recovery. 12-step Christian program. Family promise is that if we love our neighbors, we're going to care about these homeless families that are all around us. And so we have family promise where we are helping these homeless families, mothers and children, get off the street. And I was just driving yesterday, and I was looking, and I saw homeless camp after homeless camp after homeless camp along the 5 freeway. People are hurting. People are devastated. And so, you know, can we love all of them? Well, we can love all of them, but let's start right here in this community and see how we can love the homeless people and help them rebuild. So that's family promise. Another goal that you're familiar with, and I love this. This is Park Vista, and Park Vista is this senior housing project that is right next to us here. We have built such a strong relationship with them. We have many people from Park Vista that come to activities and are actually a part of this church. And so we are loving the widows and the orphans and the elderly people that are right here around us. And so you know those things. You've heard about those things. We're going to keep doing those. That's our goal for 2020. But we've added this top one, the Hilltop Christina Daycare. <laughs> That's Hilltop Christian day, day camp and preschool. And so here's, this, this is really, the, the leadership and, and the elders have really spoken into this over the last couple months and said, you know what? We have a hundred families, think about that. We have a hundred families here, eight hours a day, five days a week. These children, these precious children. Let's set a goal of building a bridge with these families, 80% who are not walking with Jesus Christ. Probably over 80%. What if we could really love them and serve them. And as I told you last week, we just gave out a survey of three different categories and about six things in each category. And we just asked them, how can we serve you? And remember, they thought, okay, that's a little weird, you know, because people don't just serve unconditionally anymore. People don't love unconditionally anymore. So they're like, what do you want out? We don't want anything. We just want to how to serve you. And, and we've gotten like 25 families that responded to that survey, and they checked almost everything that we put down. There's no way we could do everything. So we gotta choose those top ways that we can serve them in the name of Jesus Christ, because they have needs, and if we authentically love and serve them, we're gonna build relationships with them. They're gonna see the light of Jesus shine through us. I cannot wait to see what God does as we build relationships and love our neighbors, starting with this these families that are right here, already a part, and coming to this facility. And we're serving them through the daycare. But could you just for, just imagine for a little bit, let's say five families start coming to this church. If we were to have five more families this morning, we would have a hard time fitting them in here. We'd have to add some rows even out the back here, add some chairs. Just five families, right? What, and what if we started baptizing families into Jesus Christ? Not like one person at a time, although everyone matters. What if we just started baptizing whole families into Jesus? Can you imagine the love and energy and hope? I think that could just infuse to this church. You say, well, five families is too many. No, no it's not. Five families could happen because it starts with just one family. 
just one family. Think about for a moment the power of one family that falls in love with Jesus Christ. By show of hands, how many here this morning remember well Lori Garrett? Raise your hand. Hi, I want to see it. Lori Garrett. Maybe 10% of us. Let me just, can I just remind you, let me take a moment to remind you of the power of one family. When we came here, there were maybe a handful of people that said, we really want to grow this church and this community. We want to see people come to Jesus. There are probably maybe 20 people here. And they asked if we would come and work with the church here. And within two weeks, God put one word on our heart that directed the vision of this church. And that word was welcome. With the two weeks of us being here, one word, God says, be the most welcoming church on the planet. So when Byron and Leah leave last Sunday, I got a text from him this morning, in Austin, Texas, they, they leave last Sunday, such a beautiful couple impacted for less than a year here, and they said, we miss Hilltop already. He just sent me that text, we miss you guys. And what did they say? They said, one of the most powerful things about this church is you are a welcoming church. Praise God, we can keep growing in that, right? But that word welcome is a part of our core. And so I get a call literally two weeks after being here from a girl by the name of Lori Garrett. She calls on the phone and she is just sobbing. She can't even talk. I said, Lori, come on in. Let's meet. Tell me what's going on. She walks into this office here, walks through those doors. Again, just breaks down, can't even stand it crying so hard. She says, I have been addicted to methamphetamines for half my life, and I'm going to lose my five-year-old daughter, Miranda, if I get arrested again. Can you help me? And I said, absolutely. Jesus loves you, and let's study, and let's pray. And so we set a date the following week to get together and study about Jesus. But Friday, before she comes in, I get a text on a, it's a pager. Um, I don't know if you know what a pager is, but we, we didn't have cell phones. We had these pagers. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yet. You know, you put them on your belt. You're right. And they would vibrate, okay? And they would have a number there. So you, it would ding, 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 or vibrate, and you go to the page. So I'm playing basketball up in Pepperdine with Scott Lambert, a bunch of friends. I get this page. I did have a car phone, however. So I thought I was cool. So I went to my car, and of course the phone is like that big, and it comes with a case, and two hands to hold it to your ear, right? And so I called, and they said, it's the Los Angeles Police Department. And we've arrested a young lady by the name of Lori Garrett. And she's gonna go to jail for a long time. And she would like to turn custody of her five-year-old daughter over to you. I had met her one time, one time, and I was the only person she would trust with her precious little girl, Miranda. I see, that's what drug addiction can do. By the way, Tim sent me a text this morning. I, I missed Tim. Tim's up north helping his mom, but he celebrated uh, four or five, five years of being clean and sober this morning. Praise God for that. Awesome. So, um... So Lori is going to be arrested, so I hop in my car and I tell the police, sure, absolutely, about halfway to the police department, I'm thinking, I better call Becky. <laughs> so, hey babe, we're going to have another child. <laughs> no, we've talked about this, who's enough? And of course, I explained the situation to her and she's like, absolutely, and, and, and listen, I'll never forget getting to the Los Angeles courthouse, walking up a long flight of stairs walking in these big glass doors, and there is Lori in handcuffs, sobbing. There's Miranda, just big, beautiful brown eyes, just weeping. And I got down on my hands and knees, because I'd never even met her. And I said, Miranda, we're gonna be your family. And you know, my wife, Becky, we live in El Segundo, we're gonna take you in, and you're gonna live with us, and it's gonna be okay. And I have a five-year-old son, Zachary, who's your age, and and boy, just can you imagine how hard that is on a child? And so she, she gets into our car, and we start to take her home. We get her home. And I'm going to fast forward for time's sake. Um, about two weeks later, Lori gets off on a technicality. 
and she doesn't have to spend time in prison. And she's reunited with her daughter, and we start studying about the power of Jesus Christ. And she wants to give her life to Jesus, and Lori is baptized into Jesus Christ, and she falls in love with Jesus. You know, the first thing you do, like when you're baptized, you know how you're just like fired up about Jesus, and you can't help but just share with people about Jesus and what he's done for your life? You know, like, man, I'm transformed. And so she says, John, will you... Go around with me and talk to all my friends about Jesus. Absolutely. Who are her friends? Drug addicts. <laughs> so I went from meeting to meeting with Lori. Remember that? Some of you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, one, one, one time I took her, her drugs from her because she was up and down and up and down. This is before she became a Christian. And, and I brought this drug paraphernalia to Jeff Dimmick, who's very straight laced. This is Monica's cousin. I'm like, what do I do with this, this? He's like, don't bring it to me. <laughs> anyway, story after story. But here's the thing. I start meeting her drug-addicted friends. We baptize probably 25 recovering addicts in up to two years. 25 families impacted by, from one person, one conversion. God using Lori Gurney. So now this church, we meet here, we've got 25 recovering addicts and 25 kind of born and raised Church of Christers. The worship was interesting to say the least. They would get up to say communion and Lord Jesus protect their tongues, right? So you might remember Jerry Beasley, right? Jerry Beasley did time next to Charles Manson. He was in jail more than out of jail. And Francis Calhoun would just sit by Jerry, pet his hair, tattooed from head to toe, Jesus loves you, right? It's hard work. It's hard work, but God's on the move, and that's the power of one that I want you to see. And you could be the one. It doesn't have to be a family from daycare. And we want to reach them, but what if Jesus Christ lights you up? What if you truly love Jesus' heart, soul, mind, and strength? It's going to transform how you see life and what you do in life, and it's going to change the face of this church. You could be that. One more quick story. Van McElroy. So when Becky and I got married in 1986, how many of you remember Van McElroy? Just a handful of us. Van McElroy, so we worshiped here in 86 to 93 before I went into full-time ministry. And Van McElroy, the Los Angeles Raiders, not the Oakland Raiders, the Los Angeles Raiders were at the middle school here in town. That was their practice field. And Van McElroy, all priests say, all Pro free safety for the Oakland Raiders six years in a row. And he was on fire for Jesus Christ. And he and his family and his wife, Gail, still dear friends of ours, they sat and they worshiped here every Sunday that they could. And they give us tickets to Raiders games. And it's the only time I had to fake like I like the Raiders. They give us like 50 yard line tickets. We love the Raiders, right? Okay, but, but listen, hey, let me just tell you a story about Van. And then we're going to wind up, because I know we're running out of time here. So Van loves Jesus, and he loves the community of church. And he's here every time that he can show up, and they are just given, and they're part of the family here. And a young man in town by the name of Nathan Piper was sitting out on the curb, and he had his legs out over the curb, and a car swerved over and hit his legs and just actually just rolled over his feet. <coughs> and so it, I think it broke both of his ankles. And so he was in the hospital. And so Van says, I've got to go visit this kid. I've got to go pray with this kid. And so he shows up to the hospital and he brings a couple friends with him. He shows up with a signed football for Nathan and gives it to him. And his friend Wayne Gretzky Signed, has a signed hockey stick that he gives him. An all-pro tackle, I think his name was Matt Millen, uh, for the Raiders. They all show up. Can you imagine the impact that that made on this young boy's life and this family's life, the Pipers who were a part of Hilltop and, and loved Jesus and worshipped here for years? One family. You say, well... He's a professional football player, so he has huge influence. No, he just loves Jesus, and that's why he has huge influence. Because you've got a drug addict fresh out of jail or an all-pro football player 
both in love with Jesus, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that makes a difference. So I want to see what God's going to do with this vision. I want to see, you know, when Jagger and Jonas show up to church, the two J's of Hilltop, Jagger and Jonas, what if one family, two families, three families with children come to fall in love with Jesus and become a part of the church. And then they share with another family and another family what God is doing in this church. And so we don't just have two children, you know, that are babies. We've got family after family. And so, and what about our teenagers, right? We've got some of the best teenagers, I think, on the planet at Hilltop. I love them. But what if then their older brothers and older sisters start coming and the youth group starts to grow and the children's ministry. We have great children here, but we... You know, we've got Courtney's wonderful kids. Courtney and Chris are here this morning. We've got Andrew and Rachel's beautiful children, right? But what if we just start to pack those rooms with families falling in love with Jesus? I could go on all morning, but I want you to imagine what God could do if we live this passage out. Okay, one more slide. That's loving our neighbors locally. And then regionally or globally, we talked about Compassion International. We're actually trying to line up a date in March where we have a representative. This is loving our neighbors globally, right? We're going to love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, the, the Gospel of John. We're going to love our neighbors locally. We celebrate recovery through the daycare. That's our goals for this year. We're going to love our neighbors globally as we continue. By Our goal is to eradicate extreme child poverty in the world. That's our goal for 2020. Will you help us with that goal? Last year, we adopted an entire city in the Dominican Republic, an entire 40 children in this poor, poor city. We adopted them and are sharing our resources and sharing the knowledge of Jesus through our resources with that family. What's the name of that town? Dominican Republic, that's all, yeah. But man, okay, so we're gonna do, that's still a goal. We've got, uh, we've got uh, Mexico, we've got the women's shelter in Mexico, we've got the orphanage where the children come in Mexico, and we've got Operation Christmas Child, where we bring Christian, uh, we bring Christmas in November, early, or November, yeah, to the, to the world, to kids that don't have it. I don't know how many boxes went out, we put out probably several hundred, but the Samaritans first put out how many? Hundreds of thousands? A million? Kids that can't get Christmas without our help. So we're going to love our neighbors globally. All right. I want you this morning as we close to think about how is God going to use you to be a part of what he wants to accomplish great things at this church. I want you to stay for lunch, even if you didn't plan on it. And we'll have some food and we'll have a discussion together. You could make some of the most fantastic spiritual friends in your life. Already right here. But as we grow, who knows what God's going to bring to us. The joy of the Lord is going to just spread like a wild, wildfire. Starting with you. And what God wants to do you at the top. Let me pray, sing one more song, and then we'll be out of here. All right? Stay for lunch. Let me pray for us. God, we, we've talked a lot this morning, Lord. But help us, Father, to remember four words. All we have to take from this morning is four words. Love God. Love our neighbors. Father, we are surrounded by people who have needs. We're surrounded by brokenness in our towns all around us. Give us eyes to see the opportunities to love you more and to love our neighbors and what that can do through us in Jesus' name. Amen.